now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. An episode of the Short Run Western series, Luke Slaughter of Tombstone, starring Sam Buffington. I, I can't help but think this show, if it had come out eight years earlier, it would have been very successful. This episode from June 1st, 1958, Cattle Drive. Slaughter's my name, Luke Slaughter. Cattle's my business. It's a tough business. It's big business. I've got a big stake in it. There's no man west of the Rio Grande big enough to take it from me. Luke Slaughter of Tombstone. Luke Slaughter of Tombstone, Civil War cavalryman turned Arizona cattleman. Across the territory, from Yuma to Fort Defiance, from Flagstaff to the Huachucas, and below the border through Chihuahua and Sonora, his name was respected or feared, depending on which side of the law you were on. Man of vision, man of legend, Luke Slaughter of Tombstone. <laughs> I came from Texas to the Arizona Territory with 2,000 head of scrawny longhorns. But the good grass in the valley of the San Pedro fattened them up like butter. And when I got a contract to deliver 1,000 head to the Indian agency at San Carlos, I signed with a clear conscience. When you sell beef to the government, they want good beef. They always seem to want it yesterday. Hey, Wichita. Yo. Where are the steers from the southeast section? One and Jose went for him. Uh, you, Frankie, don't run them critters. They gotta be delivered with legs on. Well, they won't lose much weight on the trail to San Carlos. Nope. A lot of grass on the route you picked. Have to hustle them to make it in six days, old Luke. Yeah, we sure can't let them do any sightseeing. Closer at the next batch, Frankie. Well, I wish we had a few more hands. 1,500 Longhorns is a big passel for six men and a cook. A 1,000 head, Wichita. That's what the contract calls for. If we deliver two out of every three we start out with, we're doing mighty nifty. Now, what are you talking about? If I lost one out of ten on a simple six-day trail in perfect spring weather, I wouldn't dare call myself a cattleman. Luke, you've been operating in Texas where there ain't no mountains, no rivers, no engines, no rustlers, and no legal acting robbers who charge you in cattle if you set foot on their grazeland. There ain't no problems in Texas. Matter of fact, there ain't nothing in Texas. <laughs> I knew I had some reason for coming to Arizona, but I'm still not losing one for three. Oh. Or... Buenos dias, senor Slaughter, senor Witch. The name's Wichita. And where's them critters you and Jose was supposed to cut and bring in? They come with Jose. Oh, why didn't you help him, Juan? We're in a hurry. It don't take Jose long, only 50 little cattle. I told you to cut a hundred, you loafing scalawag. There were not a hundred left. I think maybe Ramirez visited the southeast section last night. Luke, I've been telling you it was Ramirez picking away at our herd. This time he's really hit us, and if you're asking me... You'd better get out of Parsi and go after him. Well, there isn't time, Wichita. If we don't hit the trail today, we can't live up to the contract. Uh, yeah, and now we ain't got more than about 1,300 head fit for the trail. And if you aim to deliver a 1,000, you better take them all. All right, Wichita. You know Arizona better than I do. But I'll bet we come back with at least 300 steers with my brand on them. I bet you six months' pay we don't. Easy, streak. Easy. We're going to start them soon. Six months' pay. That's what I'll bet you. All right, I'll give you a real bet. Six months of your wages against Blue Streak here. Now, Luke, 
If you've got to lose the best horse in your string to learn yourself a lesson, I'm willing to teach you. So far, so good, Luke. Right, which time? We'll make a good 20 miles again today. Yeah. Herd looks so much smaller than it did when we started yesterday. Anything happen while you was riding night watch? Nothing much, except now I know Ramirez is in the neighborhood. Well, why didn't you wake the boys and go after them? Well, they need their sleep. They better deliver these cactus boomers on schedule. But you can't let that thieving Mexican keep cutting in on your herd like this. Right now I have to, Wichita. Well, if you was to ask me... I didn't. Now let's keep these critters moving. Yeah, get along there. Got the coffee boiling there, Cookie? Yeah, sure have, Mr. Slaughter. Fix your breakfast and two jerks if you're ready. Nah, I'll wait until the sun and the men get up. But you've been riding watch since midnight for three nights. Yeah, I'm a little tired at that. You know, this is a good night horse, but he's no blue streak. With streak, I can catch a few winks in the saddle and leave the watching up to him. Oh, you shouldn't have betting him against Wichita's pay. We ain't going to get back home with no 300 head. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> This pony's learning. We got visitors out there. Well, wait while I grab me a Mustang and a gun, Mr. Slaughter. I'll let you know if I need any help. Let's go, boy. You looking for something, gentlemen? Whose outfit's this? Belongs to Luke Slaughter from down below Tombstone. You boys ever hear him? Not me. No. Me neither. You his trail boss? That's right. We watched you bed the outfit down from the mesa. I'd say you got something over a thousand head. Yeah, that's right. We were delivering a thousand to San Carlos. Government business don't pay. They're too fussy. But good luck to you anyhow. Thanks. Oh, by the way, you're crossing private graze. This is part of Wendell Miller's spread. Our maps don't say so. Map makers can't keep up with things these days. I don't blame you for taking this short trail to San Carlos. If only you understand it'll cost you a hundred head. Well, if this is Miller's land and that's his crossing fee, have your boys cut him out. I haven't got the time or the men to argue. Slash those logs tight, boys. If they come loose in midstream, we lose our chuck wagon. It looks like she'll float all right, Mr. Slaughter. Yeah, it's a good trick to get the wagon across, Luke, but... Uh... Texas trick. We did have one little river back there. But if we drive downstream 11, 12 miles, the critters can ford. Yeah, and we'd lose a day. Well, the current's running too strong here. Them lazy longhorns will let themselves wash down river, and we'll lose two days rounding them up again. Blue streak will make them swim. One, Frankie. You both got your top horses? Si, senor Slaughter. Good. Follow Streak and me and try to do what we do. The rest of you head the steers into the river. Keep them coming steady. We're going to lose half of what's left. Come on, Blue Streak. Up. Cookie, once that stubborn loop gets something into his head. Hey, 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 look at that gray horse swim at them steers. Why, he's, he's a-hazing them like he was on dry land. And he's learning the other horses how to do it. Wichita, they got them brainless longhorns swimming across in a straight line. Well, maybe they do know a thing or two in Texas. I still don't see how you done it, Luke. We didn't lose more than ten head in the river. Uh, Blue Streak knows more about cattle than most waddies. Real thoughtful of you to rest them tonight. You can turn them over to me nice and fresh. <laughs> <laughs> Which is how you really think you're going to win that bet? <laughs> I know it. If we got 1,100 head at this point, I'll eat them. No, don't eat them. They're sold. 
And we'll make San Carlos by mid-afternoon tomorrow. Yeah, and I'll have me a big gorilla horse. Uh, maybe. What you stopping for? The show. What show? Those stars. Millions of them. Pretty, aren't they? Yeah. And mighty helpful when you're lost at night. Nah, I wasn't thinking about that. I was just thinking about... Well, yeah, about nature. Yeah. Hmm. For instance, that old owl and that coyote might even be talking to each other. Yeah. And they might be talking Apache language. You think so? Sure do. And we're going to lose another parcel of cattle if we don't ride out there and stop them. And get scalped in the middle of the night. We'll collect from them on the way back, in daylight. Well, my count was a thousand head plus 19. Agree with yours, Mr. Slaughter? Well, I added plus 15. Yeah, shall I add the extras to the amount of the treasury draft, or uh, you driving them back? I'll throw them in free. Save the government a little money. Give your Indians a little extra beef. His engines got a little extra beef. They snuck about 50 head right out from under our noses last night. Oh, I doubt if they were reservation Indians. There's a renegade band somewhere south in the Aravipa Hills. Yeah, but the cavalry from Fort Thomas will dig them out for long. I'll get the draft ready for you, Mr. Slaughter. That's fine, sir. Well, Luke, you've done a better job than I thought you would that. I'll let you ride Blue Streak part way home. <laughs> I'll ride him all the way, Wichita. <laughs> We may be starting home without a herd, but our bet pays off on how many we're driving when we get there. In a moment, Luke Slaughter of Tombstone returns. June 1st, 1958, Luke Slaughter of Tombstone on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. We are very fortunate to have the entire, I think it's an 18 series run, of Luke Slaughter of Tombstone. Uh, it was a Sunday afternoon show. It suffered from a lack of clearance, but uh, it was a good show. Uh, June 1st, 1958, Luke Slaughter of Tombstone. And now, Act Two of William N. Robeson's production of Luke Slaughter of Tombstone. We'd made our drive to San Carlos in six days. The men expected to get home in three, but I had some unfinished business to take care of. Look down in the basin there, boys. About 50 Longhorns and six Apache herdsmen. Uh-huh. Bound to be our critters. The four of us going to tackle the six of them? Well, if we did, we'd have at least 20 more braves pouring down from those wickiups on the far side. Give me your guns, Wichita. Thanks. Now, Juan and I are going to circle behind the camp to draw those Apaches away from the cattle. When we do... You and Frankie hightail it in and drive them east as fast as they'll go. Well, now we come a fur piece to pick up 50 measly longhorns, but east, we're a tombstone southwest of here. Sure. But like you say, we've come a fur piece. And when I get those steers back, I aim to keep them. <laughs> Four pistols loaded, one. See? Si. Bueno. Just circle and keep firing. And when the Apaches come after us, well, we've got better horses. Let's go. Luke's made a bad mistake, Frankie. We run the cattle east till they're ready to drop. And where do we wind up? I don't know. It ain't pleasant country, though, I'll tell you that. Uh, it's Indian country, that's what it is. 
Why, there could be an Apache behind every boulder, and Luke's got our six guns, and then we... Hey, there's one now. What? What? Mr. Bagby? Well, I... well you ain't uh, an Apache. <laughs> no. Captain Marcotte attached to the cavalry at Fort Thomas. Mr. Slaughter suggested that you might enjoy the company of some of my men as far as the fort. Enjoy it? <laughs> <laughs> Your chuck wagon and remuda are there already. And Mr. Slaughter says he'll join you as soon as he herds those renegade Indians back to the reservation. The next order of business was the cattle baron, Wendell Miller, whose men had charged me a crossing fee of a hundred head. He wasn't the kind you call out the United States Cavalry for. I went to his spread alone, under the name of Link Slater. I told him I wanted to get started in the cattle business. I flattered him until he was treating me like a long-lost nephew. Now, there's the herd I have in mind for you, Link. An even hundred head, prime longhorns. Well, I don't know that I'm much of a judge yet, but uh, they look fine to me. My foreman picked them up. The drover was going through last week, a little short of cash, I guess, and bought and got them for ten dollars a head. You get them for what I paid for them. You've got a bill of sale, I suppose. <laughs> That's right, young fella. <laughs> In the cattle business, we don't take anybody's word. <laughs> oh, well, no, I didn't oh, mean that. Oh, it's all right. That's all right. You're a promising young man. And I'd like to see you make a real go out of that little place you told me about. Try to build it up to a, to a spread like this one. Well, I don't know that I can ever do that. You can if you're willing to take some advice. I'd be grateful for it. All right, Link. This is a tough new country. Man's got to make his own laws. He's got to keep his eyes and ears open and take what he wants. Prove you can do that, you'll be all right. That's just what I'm going to prove. Now, uh, how about that bill of sale? Oh, yes, of course, my boy. <laughs> the receipt for 100 head at $10 a head, signed by a fella named uh, Luke Slaughter, or something like that. I see. The steers all seem to have a lazy S brand. Mr. Miller, can I tell you something about keeping your eyes and ears open? (laughs) Now, don't tell me that one of these critters here is missing a horn or that he bellows off key. (laughs) Look at the brand on my horse. And listen while I say Luke Slaughter and Link Slater. What? You heard me. And now suppose you show me a map of your spread. And I'll show you that these steers were taken off a trail five miles west of your farthest boundary. Now look here, Slater. It's Slaughter. And I don't like having the name forged. My foreman brought in the cattle and the receipt. I'm not going to court to argue about it. Like you advised me, I'm making my own laws. And I'm taking those steers for exactly what you paid for them. Nothing. Finally, there was the business that started long before the drive. The business of Ramirez. Well, Luke, last camp before we hit the home range again. Maybe. How do you mean maybe, Senor Slaughter? We drive it easy tomorrow with so few cattle. (laughs) My golly, Luke, if you could have picked up 150 more of our own brand summers, you would have won our bet. Uh, Bet or no bet. Everybody's worked hard, and tomorrow we ought to have some fun. Who wants to go hunting? Oh, for the... Luke, you just want to put off handing Blue Streak over to me. I ain't a going. <laughs> me and Jose, we were the best hunters in all Sonora. Bears, deers, pumas, eagles, a- apaches. We hunt anything, Jose and me. Good. Then you're just the men I need for tomorrow. Gracias. What we hunt for? Ramirez. Ramirez? Sure. We know he's operating around here. Uh... I think maybe not. Ramirez has moved. I bet he ain't moved far. That's right. With a couple of great hunters like Juan and Jose, we shouldn't have any trouble finding him. But uh, Ramirez has many men. We don't have so many. I've heard that Ramirez will accept a man-for-man challenge. All we have to do is get word to him somehow that you and Jose and I want to meet him and his two best men. Senor Slaughter, I would like to do this, but... I just remember my mother. 
She was very sick when I leave. I, I, I better go see her now, pronto. Well, I'm sorry to hear that one. It'll have to be Jose and me against Ramirez. Well, what about me? You said you wouldn't go hunting. Se- Senor Slaughter, Jose's little brother, his wife is going to have a baby, so he better go to Hermosillo, too. You give us our pay? Well, of course, boys. Here's yours, Jose. 30 gold for you, Juan. Frankie. Yeah, boss. These boys want their ponies out of the remuda. Gracias, senor. June 1st, 1958, Luke Slaughter of Tombstone on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. The conclusion follows these messages from your favorite radio station. Just going to take a minute here to tell you about the big savings going on now, the claret sale at MyPillow.com. And you know, I've talked about how in my office, I have a pair of my slippers and they're really comfortable and they're on clearance right now. The MyPillow.com slippers, $25 a pair, limit 10. And I would buy three or four more pairs. Unfortunately, they're out of my size. They also have sheets, pillowcases, clothing items, all on special right now. Go to MyPillow.com, click on the clearance tab at the top of the page, use my promo code Wyatt, or call 1-800-928-4715. Limited sizes remaining in the MyPillow slippers, limited colors on other items. MyPillow.com, clearance tab, promo code Wyatt, one 800 928-4715. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, the conclusion of Luke Slaughter of Tombstone, Cattle Drive, June 1st, 1958. Looks like some people don't want to stick around. Jose and me, we would stay if you needed us for the cattle. But I understand. Caramba. I hope you find your families in the best of health. Uh, si, uh, muchas gracias. Oh, uh, Juan, if you happen to run across Ramirez, tell him I'll be right plum in the middle of Rio Verde Meadow at noon tomorrow, all alone, on a big gray horse. <laughs> Can't bear to watch it happen to you, Luke. Then go on back and wait with the herd and the chuck wagon. Maybe Ramirez didn't get your message. Don't worry about that. He got it. Juan saw to that. Whoa. Whoa. Oh. Well, Wichita, you can either go back or wait here on the rim. I'm riding into that basin alone. Luke, ain't you ain't you never heard how? Ramirez fights. Sure. He'll come charging down with that big shotgun blazing. And, and tear you to bits before he's in your pistol range. You know, Wichita, the United States Army is always testing new weapons. The boys at Fort Thomas wanted me to try out this rifle. That skinny thing? <laughs> How far will it shoot? Nobody's quite sure. So I'm going to aim and let Ramirez fire first. If this rifle's no good, well, I guess you'll have to take the herd in yourself. I'm as ready as I'll ever be, Streak. Hope he doesn't keep us waiting too long. Hola! Right on the dot. He's way short. This rifle better not be. Tumbled him. Go, Streak! Your first shot, she break my hand, senor. Your next shot, she break my arm. Your next shot, she miss. I guess I haven't got the hang of this rifle yet. Your pistol is still loaded, no? If I let you go, 
Would you take your men across the border and stay there? <laughs> I guess so. She's pretty nice in Sonora. All right. But if I ever hear of you setting foot on United States soil again, I'm coming after you, and you'll never go back alive. <laughs> A man does not seize a branding iron twice by the hot end, senor. And there's one more thing, Ramirez. A matter of several hundred cattle with the lazy-ass brand. I aim to have them back before you leave. Three sixty-six, sixty-seven, three sixty-eight. That would you make it, Wichita? I quit counting at three hundred, Luke. <laughs> oh my! No more wages coming for six months, and I ain't got enough cash to even buy me a pint of tonsil varnish. Well, you wouldn't have, except that you lost that bet before your pay got doubled. Wait, what? Come on now. Let's get those cattle to grass. Yeah! Luke Slutter of Tombstone, starring Sam Buffington, was written by Fran Van Hartisfeld and directed by William N. Robeson. Editorial supervision by Tom Hanley. Supporting Mr. Buffington were Junius Matthews, Don Diamond, Peter Leeds, Barney Phillips, and Norm Alden, with music composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Next week at this time, we return with... Slaughter's the name. Luke Slaughter. When we meet up again, you can call me that. Luke Slaughter. 1957 was Sam Buffington's breakthrough career. He did some television work. He was on Alfred Hitchcock Presents. He played a thoroughly disagreeable character. Reviewers claimed it's Sam Buffington's portrayal of a rude, sloppy hypochondriac which steals the show. In six months, he would have roles in six films, all released in 1958, five more TV shows, an auspicious first year, and then Luke Slaughter of Tombstone. And he did a lot of good work. Sadly, despite, uh, I, I have to tell you, that uh, Buffington committed suicide in 1960, and he said he couldn't support his wife. And yet he had made $20,000 the year before, a reasonable amount for a young actor whose career was just growing. Buffington committing suicide by gas woo, at the age of 28 in May of 1960. Luke Slaughter of Tombstone, June 1st, 1958 on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Well, it's been a while. Let's check in with the soap opera Claudia, uh, this episode from June 1st, 1948 on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Your Coca-Cola bottler presents Claudia, based on the famous play and novels by Rose Franken. Brought to you transcribed Monday through Friday by your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. Relax, and while you're listening, refresh yourself. Have a Coke. And now, Claudia. Oh, just smell the air, David. The evening air in Eastbrook is so wonderfully fragrant. Just another five minutes' drive and we'll be home. It seems even sweeter on the farm. I hope so. Did you tell Claudia I was coming? I didn't have a chance to call her. We left the office in such a hurry. But it'll be a pleasant surprise for her. Doesn't she mind this kind of pleasant surprise? Good heavens, no. She thrives on them. You have quite an extraordinary wife. I know I have. That reminds me. What about your lunch? Hmm? What about it? Well, do we or do we not tell Claudia? Do we or do we not tell her what, David? Don't pretend to be dull. Tell her about with whom you had your lunch. Oh, oh you mean about my lunching with Victoria Manners. At oh. last. After all, it's not every day that you lunch with Broadway's handsomest star. Or is it? 
it isn't, thank heavens. Thank heavens? I thought she was a glorious-looking creature. I ate so much, I was so sleepy all afternoon, I could hardly keep my head up. But uh, you must have had beautiful dreams of the beautiful Victoria Manners. I don't know whether to take you seriously or not. Take me seriously and answer me. Are you going to tell Claudia about your having lunch with Victoria Manners? Of course I am. Why not? Well, uh, I mean, it uh, isn't the sort of thing one usually tells a wife, is it? Frankly, I don't know. I haven't had lunch with a blonde, unattached, single female since the day I was married. I suppose it isn't the thing one tells a wife. Now you're making sense. At least it isn't what one tells an average, everyday, typical wife, but Claudia isn't that kind of wife. They never are. Until they are. (laughs) You are very profound today, Roger. But, David, why tell Claudia something that may hurt her unnecessarily? Because I think enough of Claudia that I know it isn't going to hurt her. After all, I was going out to lunch in the first place because I promised Claudia I was going to eat a decent meal. Then, when Miss Manners just happened by and invited me to join... Happened by? She took an elevator up 22 floors, knocked on our office door, and invited you to take her to dinner. And that isn't just a casual chance occurrence. As far as I'm concerned, it was. Personally, I think she's a rather dull young person. Miss Manners has lived a great deal too much without having understood enough of it. So I shall tell Claudia. I'll make a bet with you, Roger. Hmm, Anything you say. I'll bet you that Claudia doesn't raise an eyebrow. I'll bet you that Claudia is absolutely delighted and pleased and will suggest that I do it more often. Ten dollars on that. Ten dollars it is. Well, this is going to be an easy way of getting my money back for what I considered was a very expensive lunch. Ho, ho, ho. Here we are. Home sweet home. All right, all out. Look, David, let's forget that silly bet. Don't tell Claudia about Victoria Manners. What's the, what's the use? You're really serious. You really think she'll be upset. Oh, not necessarily, but... It was so innocent. There's no need to tell her. Well, that's exactly why. Oh, now I wish I'd gone straight on to Boston. Uh, now you're starting to get me worried. David, welcome home. I've been waiting for you all day. Hello, darling. And Roger, what a wonderful surprise. I do hope you don't mind, but David insisted. Mind, it's wonderful. The sheets came back from the laundry and everything. I am not spending the night. I am merely borrowing a little dinner, and then I'll be on my way. We will discuss that (laughs) later. Oh, it's so nice to have you home. Come on, come on, both of you, into the house. Tell me, what did you do all day? Oh, I I played a little golf, a couple of sets of tennis, went swimming a while, and then I flew my airplane down to Texas. My, you you worked hard. He did. He worked all day. He hardly stopped. Oh, come on, let's sit in the living room and talk. You can wash up afterwards. Roger. Hmm? Did you say that David hardly stopped working all day? Hardly. And he accomplished worlds of work. David, answer me. Did you stop for lunch? Barely. Roger. But Roger, when I called, you told me David had gone out to lunch. That he was going to eat enormously. Oh, so I did. And I did eat enormously. He hardly took any time over it. Uh, did you, David? Only two hours. Two hours? Two hours. I told you he eat a 12-course dinner, not a 24-course one. Well, David eats very slowly. Say, what is going on here? First he hardly stops to take a deep breath, then he eats so slowly it takes two hours. Now, wait a minute. Now, listen, Roger. Get this straight. A bet is a bet. David. David, let's uh, call it off. I warned you. What's the big secret? Did you have a stomachache, David? Not quite. Darling, tell me the truth. Tell me you had a decent meal. You hardly had any breakfast. Tell me that you I ate. I ate at La Place. Ooh. A French restaurant. I ate everything on the menu. I'll never do it again. I was sleepy all afternoon. Oh, whew. Is that what the mystery's about? That's all. That's and all. Claudia, this partner of mine is living in the past. Oh? He is so consumed with intrigue and romance. <laughs> that he's a- afraid I'll tell you, darling, that I had a beautiful blonde for lunch. <laughs> no wonder it took you two hours. <laughs> Was she tough or tender? (laughs) You see, Roger? Did you have her broiled, baked, or fried? (laughs) You see, David? She still doesn't believe you. I don't believe what? Darling, I am not Jack the Giant Killer. You're not? I thought you were. I did not eat the blonde. (laughs) I had lunch with her. Blonde? 
I didn't know you knew a blonde. What blonde? Tell me all about her. You met her the other night, dear. Victoria Manners. You had lunch with Victoria Manners? Ho, ho, ho. Hush up. Well, how, how, how come you had lunch with her? Well, I was just leaving the office because I'd promised you that I would eat a good lunch. Don't blame her on me. Ho, ho, ho. And there I was with my hat and coat on. Too warm for a coat today. Figuratively speaking, I was, I was just about to leave the office when Miss Manners came in and simply point blank invited me to have lunch with her. Well, that was very forward of her, wasn't it? Did you have to accept? Well, I, I didn't want to be rude out oh, here. I see. After all, she's a, a friend of mm. a friend of yours. I Practically a relative. And she was... She was very nice and... Just uh, how nice was she, David? Well, she was very friendly. She, she just... Very was... friendly, eh? I'll bet she was friendly. David, don't say I didn't warn you. Darling, you're, you're not jealous, are you? Well, not exactly jealous, but the last time I asked you to have lunch with me, you said you were busy, working. I was, but, but today you made me promise I'd... Well, I don't have to say it again, do I? Must I must say, David, this is pretty sudden. I suggest you eat, and... Was she very friendly? Very. Oh, I Maybe see. someday you'll listen to me, David. I told you I've had more experience with this sort of thing. What sort of thing do you mean by this sort of thing, Roger? Uh, well, I mean... Well, it, it's just that, after all, a husband... And yes? A... Oh, I ought to have had enough sense to keep quiet. David, stop blushing and tell me. What'd she have to say? Well, she... Uh, hoped you were feeling well. It's about... Oh, me? I'm fine. What else did she say? Look, David, why don't you just give me my $10 and let me un be on my way to Boston? I refuse to feel guilty. Roger, why go so fast, for heaven's sake? Well, I'd, I'd, I'd rather not be in the way while you two were... Uh, while we two what? Thrash this thing out, shall we say? What's there to thrash about? What's that $10 Roger says you owe him? Oh, we just made a bet. Uh, uh, skip it, please. Uh, Claudia, is there anything more you want to know about the lunch I had with Victoria Of course Manners? there is. Lots more. Oh, this sort of talk is fatal. Well, let's, <laughs> let's get it over with. Now, go on, Claudia. Did you really enjoy it? Is it a good restaurant? Should we go there sometime? What did you say? I simply asked if we should go. Ho, ho, ho. Now, what kind of an answer is that? Ho, ho, ho. I think you owe me $10, <laughs> Roger. You are not making any sense at all. Giving each other $10 bills as if they were dimes. You haven't told me yet if you had a decent lunch. I had a very decent lunch. But it's not going to cost me a cent. What do you mean? Darling, tell me straight the truth. Straight the I truth. I am guilty. So do you mind that I had lunch with Victoria Manners? Now, let me see. Do you mean, um, do I want to scratch your eyes out? Well, you don't have to be so violent about it. You mean it. that I'm so jealous that I can't see straight? Well, I wouldn't exaggerate You mean that I'm as... furious with you for having had lunch with another now, woman? Darling, I didn't know you'd be so upset. I'd you never... You'd prefer it if I just didn't care at all who you gallivanted around well, with? Well, I just didn't think you'd take it so seriously. So That's... you want to know whether I'm angry at you for having lunch with Victoria Manners? Is that it? I still wish you hadn't said anything, David. Were you afraid to tell me? Not until Roger started to make me feel guilty. What do you think I think, darling? I'm so mixed up, I, I don't know what to think. <laughs> One minute you're talking about she was very friendly. The next minute you want to know, was it a good lunch? And now you're threatening to scratch your eyes out. <laughs> You've got me so mixed up, I... Don't I, be mixed I'm... up. I was spoofing. And I, I don't want to scratch your eyes out, darling. I think it's an awful shame. What is an awful shame? Poor Victoria Manners. Poor Victoria Manners. She's obviously falling very much in love with you. I can't blame her at all. I did, too. I don't believe my ears. It must be awful to find yourself falling in love with a man, not being able to help it, and having the sort of feeling that it's hopeless. What on earth makes you say she's falling in love with well, me? Well, any girl, even Victoria Manners, who'd ask a married man to lunch, must be love. I'm glad I'm not her. I would like to sit down. This is momentous. Why, Roger? Because I can't be jealous of somebody I feel so sorry for. David, maybe I'm a fool to trust you. <laughs> Especially with somebody like Miss Manners. who's out to get you. But I love you. And that makes me an idiot, doesn't it? <laughs> mm. Anything but. <laughs> you win. Both of you. You're not like anything I've ever seen before. Here you are, David. Ten dollars. Thank you, Roger. 
You're welcome. Because Claudia is the most extraordinary woman I've ever laid eyes on. Thank you, Roger. Darling, you mean you've won $10 because of me? I have indeed. A nice, crisp $10 bill. <gasps> Give me. Because you are a wonderful idiot and I love you. That's wonderful. It means you can have lunch with Victoria Manners again. For nothing. And then I'll know you'll eat a really decent meal. It's wonderful. I'll go on up and wash you, too. Will I set an extra place for dinner? Mm-hmm. Dum, 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 dum. La, 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 la. It's nice, isn't it, that you can get Coca-Cola around the corner from anywhere today. You can stop when you're marketing and have an ice-cold Coke right in the grocery. You can pause during shopping for a Coke in your department store or variety store. When you're driving, you'll find Coke at the gas station, too. This friendly service enables you to shop refreshed, drive refreshed, work refreshed, whoever you are and whatever you do. Well, Mr. King, it looks like I lost $10. Well, it does look like you did. Claudia is absolutely unpredictable. She reacts absolutely differently than any other wife or woman I've ever known. Hmm, that's what makes her Claudia. To be delighted that her husband took another woman to lunch, then to be sorry for the other woman. Amazing. <laughs> oh, well, you'll get used to it, Mr. Killian. You know, a surprise every day. Hmm, what's the surprise tomorrow? Well, I understand that David's going to stay home from the office for a few days. Yes, he has a great deal of work to do drawing up the plans for the freight terminal we're designing. So I suggested he stay on the farm to do the work, uninterrupted by phones and other office distractions. Are you suggesting that there will be no interruptions or distractions at home with Claudia and Mama? Claudia promised me she'd keep his nose to the drawing board. Well, we'll see how it works out tomorrow. As I was about to say... Every day, Monday through Friday, Claudia comes to you transcribed with the best wishes of your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. So listen again tomorrow at the same time. And now this is Joe King saying au revoir. Back in the days when Coca-Cola was bottled all over the country. June 1st, 1948, Claudia on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Visit our webpage, classicradio.stream. Learn about how you can get a copy of our show and how you can uh, uh, help us out. Buy us a copy. That's always nice. Thank this station. Support their advertisers. Tell your friends the greatest radio shows of all time are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite station.